Hi guys, hi everybody. This is Amir, and I welcome you all to WTF 20, world's biggest three-day digital conference for artists. WTF is brought to you by Print Shop by Design Hill, which is one of the fastest-growing creative print-on-demand marketplace. I would like to thank our associate partners, Illustrators Artists Club, Graphic Designers Club, Pattern Designers Club, Typography Designers Club, Logo Designers Club. Basically, all of these clubs, which are the Instagram pages. Help us reach out to as much audience as possible, and help us with the uh, registration process as well. And I would like to specially thank our online learning partner, Milan Art Institute, Georgia, USA. So moving ahead, let me introduce our panelists for today. We have with us Jimbo Bernos, who is a visual designer and letterer from Barcelona, Spain. He started okay. graphic design six years ago, and that brought him to work with clients around the globe. Uh, also with us today is uh, Haley Barry, who is from Utah, USA. She's a freelance lettering artist and an illustrator. She uh, specializes in lettering projects, including murals, sign painting, and digital designs. And feels passionate about creating letter forms that are unique and individualized. And finally, we have with us Chris Pasek as a third panelist for today. Chris is joining us from New York, USA. He started his career as a graphic designer and worked at a couple of studios for approximately five years. Then he started a daily drawing project. Which eventually turned him into an awesome illustrator. So thank you guys again. Uh, thank you so much for taking out time and uh, joining us here at WTF 20. So if you want to say hi to the audience, please go ahead. Hi everyone. Thanks for joining. Yeah, we're hi guys. Talking to you all. <laughs> yeah. So guys, before we start, let's look at what Print Shop by Design Hill and WTF is all about. Guys, if you like these ads which you just saw, so don't forget to share your love to our uh, art director at Design Hill, Kevin. You can uh, express your love in, love in the chat section. So uh, to start with, uh, Jimbo, let me start with you. So where do you uh, think is the sweet spot, you know, between uh, creative satisfaction in terms of you know practicing lettering offline, the traditional way, and you know the commercial success in in digitizing uh, world as it gives it a faster execution timing. Okay, well, um, I suppose uh, you know, like I, I'm really not sure that I'm going to reply this good, but I hopefully they're going to help me out after. Um, well, I think like you know, we all need to you know feel this satisfaction. So I'm just going to bring it to my side here. Um, you know, I always enjoy to you know just do stuff for myself all the time. You know, if, even if it's digital or if it's um, you know analog. So um, I, I believe, like you know, at least when it comes to me, I think forty percent of my, you know, design career it's it's purely like satisfaction, you know, for my own creative needs, and and then this kind of translate, 
translates perfectly into my work because you know when i like if i create something new for myself every day that kind of helps me you know bring my career to the next level that's 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 pretty much what i understood this question was about but i'm really not sure so okay you know you pretty much answered a part of it let me take it to chris chris what is your opinion about it i mean doing the art digital way and uh, you know going back old school and creating it offline so how has uh, digitalization helped taking art uh, across the globe so um for me i don't um i don't think there's much of a, a difference from the way i work the difference between traditional and analog um, I, I sort of see them as just tools, whether it's um, doing it by hand with some like paint or markers versus doing it digitally. Um, I work mostly digital now, but it's more of a convenience thing because it's so much easier to do revisions or like work quickly or generate lots of ideas uh, in a fast way. Definitely for client work, it's much better for doing, um, you know, edits or stuff like that. Um, but even when I do personal work, I tend to work digitally now just because it's so convenient and easy. I can just grab my iPad and draw on it. Um, but I don't really think too much in terms of digital versus traditional because I'm sort of doing the same thing either way. I just, it's, to me, it's about the drawing. And I think the digital has come so far now that there's not that big of a disconnect, at least in, in my opinion. Hmm. Okay, that that sounds great. So, Haley, do you agree with Chris, or you have something more to add to it? I saw you nodding out there. I think there's things I could add to both. So, with the first question that you talked about, as far as like monetizing it goes, digital art really has given artists a great way to monetize things that you otherwise couldn't. Right, by creating a design digitally, you can resell that a whole bunch of times. You can license it. You can you can really do a lot with the digital design. And on the flip side, though, sometimes a traditional design. Um, like something maybe you paint by hand can also have more of a monetary value because you can't reproduce it so much. So there are good and bads with both, but I think definitely digital artwork, you can monetize it in a way that you really couldn't before with traditional mediums. Um, so that was something I was thinking of. But I think too, Chris is right. Like I've had friends before that, that say like, oh, if I can just get an iPad, I'll be so much better at lettering, you know, and that's <laughs> true. like, you know, if you can't do it on paper, you're probably not going to be able to do it digitally because they really are the same. Okay. That sounds great. So, uh, over to you, Chris, now, you know, uh, in today's, uh, digital world, every artist puts his work out there and a lot of freelance platforms, you know, where you can showcase your portfolios and stuff, you know, how difficult, uh, do you find is to you know protect your work from uh, getting copied plagiarized and how do really uh, the brands cope up with uh, having to know that you know this cop work is not plagiarized and copied from some different artists so how do you see it from both the perspectives from an artist per perspective who really uh, creates a unique stuff and then it, it gets picked up uh, by somebody else in the name of inspiration maybe and and, and the security issues from the brands and where you know it, you, it cannot audit all the artwork that is out there and cannot know that this design is let's say copied or uh, in the name of taking inspiration it's it's you know uh, completely copied uh, from it well i think um this definitely is something that i've dealt with a lot uh, my work tends to has gotten stolen a lot and and um used i think it's a result of just um quantity i've been doing a daily drawing project and posting online since 2007 so there's just a ton of work out there so um it used to bother me more and i don't know i've gotten to this point where i'm sort of okay not okay but like <laughs> there's not really anything i can do about it because even if i like watermarked it or something like that if someone wants to steal it, they steal it. A lot of these places are sophisticated and they'll just reproduce it and get rid of it. Um, so I'm not going to like compromise the visual quality of my work just to kind of protect it. Cause if someone's going to steal it, they're going to steal it. And mm -hmm. other people are like, Oh, well, you know, why don't you try and sue? But like almost every single time it happens, it's like, you know, another country or something like that, or like some <coughs> online shop. So there's not really anything I can do. Um, so, I just, you know, try not to think about it. It's it's all in a funny way. It's sort of like a, you know, when it happens, if you like post about it, you know, people are always just like, oh, I can't believe that happened. And then you like 
people talk about it and then it's almost like I don't know it's almost like a positive thing because people are like you know nice about it and you know saying oh it's so awful that they're doing that and then it's just like starts a conversation about it um but in terms of you're asking about other brands how they're making sure that it's not that it is original or like in terms of uh what do you mean by that uh, i mean to say you know when brands source uh, quality designs i mean uh, there, there's a very uh, reserved resources that they have in terms of auditing it that whether it's an original work or that particular designer or an agency has copied it from somewhere else. I know with nearly all of my client work, usually in the contract, it has to specify that I say that the work is original. So, okay. um, I mean, it would be breaking a copy or uh, breaking the contract in those cases if I was like using someone else's work or something like that. Um, okay. But maybe it's the places that are thinking. I know um, there's been situations where someone's using my artwork and then I ask them and they're like, oh, we just found it online. We thought it was fine. So okay. I think there's a, a slippery slope for sure there. Okay. So before taking opinion of Jimbo and uh, Harry here, I just wanted to uh, mention it to you guys that, you know, on Design Hill as a marketplace where we source high quality designs across the world for our uh, more than 1 million clients that we have held as of now. To our platform we have a very strong auditing system you know where our uh, 155k plus artists they help us you know know whether this design is copied by some some uh, artists <coughs> somewhere else so it's a kind of a self correction mechanism that we have at uh, design hill where they report in case uh, that uh, artwork is uh, going so it's it's all about having more eyes and more hands uh, on board and uh, moreover you know our community team also take care of uh, the auditing stuff and making sure that, you know, the client gets the original work. And we do also have uh, the contracts in place with the artists and designers who, uh, you know, we sign it before uh, assigning them any work from the client that this is going to be an original work. And we do penalize them on our platform or we do, do restrict them from any future work. So if they reproduce any artist's work. So that is our auditing system out there. So uh, Jimbo, have you ever faced any such situation or how you have dealt with it? I mean, you know, like, first of all, I, I have a lot of friends that never put anything online because they're just afraid someone's going to steal it. Okay. And, you know, I truly believe that those friends have a lot of, you know, talent that we, they are not showing to the world just because they are afraid. So I, I just, you know, like I started posting on Instagram, like, I believe like six years ago. And ever since I, I just, you know, I just, I'm not afraid of it. it. It has happened a lot of times that, you know, some people have copied it, but, um, it has never been, you know, like ripping off for a big brand. It's always gonna be like someone gonna steal something from you, but then after two days, they're gonna steal something from someone else. And then, you know, like I think like brands and people like followers and you know, the whole community can actually see through these people and they know that this is not their work. So basically like what I'm trying to do here is just like, you know, trying to make my, you know, having my own style and reaching as many people as uh, as possible you know and then they always gonna know that i did that you know so so yeah i i'm really not afraid of like you know copycats and on the other hand like uh, you know like a few years ago like i was like really hating you know hating everyone who was doing that and i decided just you know to to step down and just i'm okay like if you want to copy copy you won't get anywhere you know so i i kind of like i have a mixed feeling now that i i kind of pity someone who actually steals something from someone and then on the other hand like i decided to just feel good about it you know like the more people that copy you that means that you're good so i mean it's like a blurry line i believe but but yeah that, that's that's my thing just like put it out there and don't be afraid and and that's that's pretty much it okay great so Haley, before uh, i take your op your opinion on this so uh, do you agree with uh, Jimbo here? I mean, where do you see the trade off between, you know, going out there and reaching out to the maximum people through social media and your digital platforms? Or should someone, you know, reserve uh, his uh, art showing out there in the world so that his work stay protected? So how do you see balancing out there? Uh, which, which point would you uh, go ahead with if you have to choose uh, between the two? So I think you definitely need to put your work out there, right? Like if a tree falls in the woods and no one hears it, did it make a sound? Like if an artist makes work and doesn't show it, it doesn't matter, right? I think it's really important as artists to show our work, but I think too, it's important to educate your followers. 
about copyright and about the problems with copying because a lot of people do it with with bad intentions to make money but a lot yeah. of people have no idea that they're even doing anything wrong like i've had friends before who are not artistic who will just like get on Pinterest and see something they like and totally copy it and hang it on the wall and they don't realize they're doing anything wrong right they don't understand that and i've also had friends who you know find something online and think it's cute and just want to print it off and hang it in the house and they just don't realize the problems so i think a big thing that we can do as creatives to combat this problem is just to educate people about it to be very clear and say like hey you know if you're copying work for practice this is how you need to let people know that it's copied work or saying like hey if you want to you know have art in your house make sure you're buying it from the artist buying it from the right source so i think a lot of it is just educating people who don't have bad intentions but just don't know any better you know yeah. okay so uh, this one is to you Haley. so uh you know uh how should an upcoming artist start should he go uh traditional or should he start with a digital first i think you should do both i think it kind of depends on where you want to get to in the end like for me, I do a lot of murals and stuff and you can draw all day digitally, but if you want to do murals, you know, you need to work at painting as well. But I think they're both very helpful. They're really, really good tools with both. I don't really think there's a right or wrong answer for that. I just think it depends on where you want to be in the end, right? Like if you want to finish as a logo designer, you need to learn digital, you need to be proficient with the pen tool and illustrator, you know? So I think it just kind of depends, but I would just think mm -hmm. draw a lot is the best way to get started, whether it's digitally or traditionally draw a lot. Okay. So Chris, what's your opinion on that? I'm sure you agree with uh, Haley here. You want to add something on that? Sure. I think um, what she's saying about drawing a lot is, is the crucial point here because um, the software changes. Um, you know, we're using new things all the time. I'm using different software than I used when I started and it changes and it evolves. So I think um, it's important to make sure you're not just focusing on learning different software or even a certain technique. It's more about the um, just like uh, drawing and, and coming up with ideas and, and, and putting them out there, however you're doing it. Um, and, and, you know, the software or the technique is a separate thing. You're going to learn new things all the time, but the act of drawing and coming up with ideas is, is always going to be there and always the same. Okay. That sounds cool. So, uh, your opinion on that Jimbo. Okay, uh, I think um, it, my opinion kind of changed because, um, like, when when you know when I when I started design, um, I found that you know I had to 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 do things by hand in order to get better because you know I remember back then you know um, I would have to you know if I had to draw something or if I wanted to draw something I would you know have to wait until I get home and I open my laptop and I go into Photoshop and blah 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 so. For me, like before, like four years, five years ago, uh, getting started at, at learning something creative like that would mean that I had to wait until going home. So that's why I would defend that you know analog. It's much better all the time. And but but right now, you know, with all this technology and as I said before in my workshop, you know, with, with my iPad, like I'm not, I'm really not uh, into analog anymore. But and so I think like you, you can start in both ways, you know, you can you can get started today using, um, you know, an iPad or whatever, or getting a pencil, you know, it really doesn't matter. Um, I believe like, it's also, um, you know, if you start with something, the other thing is going to teach you something that this thing is not teaching you. So, so it's kind of like, you know, I think like a combo is it's, it's also like, really good. Uh, for example, like in, in my work, you know, like um, I believe like 95% is digital. But as she said, um, you know, like when we do murals, um, it actually helps me, you know, to see another perspective to, you know, to when I do a lettering that's like double my size, I, I have to, you know, like kind of like, re like solve different problems that I'm not facing it with the iPad. And I think like all these kind of things like, you know, just add up and, and help me become a better creative. Yeah, that's okay. It. That sounds great. So uh, I just wanted to ask you, Chris, do you think digitization, you know, it has posed a, a lot of competition for artists to reach out to clients or has this uh, digitization enabled art artists to reach out to more and more clients and hence get more business? What do you feel about it? It's like for me? The, yeah, in general. Uh, it's, it's, it's for Chris. It's up to Chris first and then I'll take your opinion. All right. Go ahead, Chris. Sorry. <laughs> no problem. So um, it, the the digital artwork creation has it um helped uh get more work to for reaching out to clients or new clients is that what you're asking yeah that's what i'm saying yeah 
Okay. Yeah. I mean, obviously, because you can, um, you know, as a freelancer, I work from home and I hardly ever see any of my clients. So um, because of the digital aspect of work, I can create um, stuff for clients all over the world. And um, that, that's obviously a, a game changer and totally uh, makes my career the way it is. So it's, uh, you know, it's, it's huge. It's, it's the sort of the basis of my whole career. Okay, that's great. So what is your opinion on that, Haley? Has the digitization posed a lot of challenges to reach out to clients because of the competition that's out there? Because anybody all across the world, you know, can create a portfolio and pitch into the clients and, you know, the freelance platforms has really enabled like design hill, the artists from all across the world to, you know, reach out to a client anywhere who has some sort of work to go out to. So do you see it as a uh, challenge or do you see it as an enabler? I think it's an enabler and I think really what it comes down to is how gritty you are and how willing you are to actually get out and get those clients because okay. posting online is one thing um, but getting real clients is another thing and a lot of times to get clients in the beginning you have to do more than just post your work like you have to be willing to get people's emails to email people you want to work for to reach out to clients that you want to be working with and to go ahead and build those relationships and through technology it's easier than ever like it is so simple to do that. You can find the information of literally anyone you want to work with and send them a message. And then as you get more professional work, work does start rolling in, but a lot of it does come down to your willingness to be able to get out there. And it's great. Like I've had clients, like I am a 22 year old in Utah, right? Like I shouldn't have that much cool work, but because of Instagram and because of being able to put that work out and to be willing to work for people, like I have been able to travel to different countries to do jobs and all around the United States to do jobs. And that would have never happened if not for the internet. <laughs> like if this would have been 40 years ago, there's no way that someone in Florida would be like, we should hire that little girl in Utah, you know? Yeah, that's correct. So Jimbo, I saw you uh, pretty much excited to answer this question. You just jumped in. So uh, no. <laughs> just take your, take your uh, opinion on that. Well, first of all, Haley, you're so young and so talented. I'm kind of <laughs> feeling bad, <laughs> like, ooh. Um, but yeah, um, you know, they, they, yeah, that's it. They both said it. Um, you know, it's a digital kind of like gave us the tools, you know, to, to just not to find clients, but like to sell, as Haley was saying in the beginning, to sell any kind of products, you know, you can, um, for example, half of my business depends on uh, selling online digital products and and the other one is clients you know and you can you can do a lot of things you know i'm just afraid that sometimes people rely too much on it and uh for, for example like um, most of my clients have been because uh, i was uh, working before in an agency and i met people and i went for beers with people and, and this kind of led me to you know get introduced to more people and that, that kind of like i'm afraid that nowadays in the internet era um, everything is great. Everything is better. I have no complaints. Um, I'm really happy about it. But I'm just um, seeing a lot of people all the time saying, how I, how do I get clients? You know, and it's not, I just want to tell them that it's not all about being an internet the whole day. You know, it's great to interact with people and, and to, to be a human and, and just, you know, go out there and, and, and talk and, 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 you know, just, yeah. I mean, we cannot do that right now, but when the situation come, gets better, I, I believe like people should just, you know, not be home the whole day and yeah, just That's find the balance. Yeah. That's correct, Jim. So, all right, I hope you guys are enjoying this discussion. So, before we move forward, I'd like to give a quick shout out to Print Shop by Design Hill for organizing this conference and our associating partners Illustrator Artists Club, Graphic Designers Club, Pattern Designers Club, Typography Designers Club, Logo Designers Club, and finally to our online learning partner Milan Art Institute, Georgia, USA. So, let me take up the questions uh, from the question section, which I've got most upwards. So we have Mirza here, whose question has got four upwards. Uh, would you suggest uh, beginners start with an internship in a company or maybe voluntary work over learning and gaining, you know, practice on your own at home, like courses, self-practice, etc. cetera, where and how to start gaining experience in the field? So uh, let me take Chris's opinion on this first. So I think... Um... It's sort of like a little bit of everything. I think it really depends on what you want to do as well. If you're more interested in going into design, maybe an internship with a design studio could be super beneficial because you learn a lot of the, um, the things that go along with it, you know, working with clients, uh, working with vendor, print vendors and stuff like that. 
Um, if you're more interested in the illustration side of things, it's usually tends to be more of a freelance type of thing. So it's more of just like working on your craft and learning things. And um, I think, you know, taking lots of, you could do classes online, learning different <laughs> drawing techniques or whatever. Um, but I, th I think there's not one, one size, an like one answer for everything. It's sort of depends on exactly what you want to do. But I think every, all of it, yes to everything. So Eddie, what do you think is, is the practical experience of uh, going through an internship uh, at some studio or should somebody uh, take a professional learning course first and then, you know, venture out uh, to work in a company or uh, start as a freelance artist? So I would say a lot of both. I think doing an internship is super duper helpful, like no matter what you're going into. For me, I did an internship at an advertising agency doing just design work. And even though I didn't do any lettering there, I learned so much about like working with printers and working with clients and things like that that are super beneficial across the board. I will say as far as taking classes goes, this is the biggest piece of advice I have, which is take classes where you are accountable to somebody. I think it's really easy to jump on skill care and some of these things and take classes and it's great, but a lot of times I feel like you don't try as hard if you're not being graded or if you're not accountable to anybody, right? Like it's really easy to sign up for Skillshare and to have these really good intentions of like, I'm going to learn so much and then to watch the class and be like, I'm going to practice that later and then never practice. So I just think no matter what classes you're doing, whether they're online or going to college or whatever, do learn as much as you can, but make sure you're accountable to someone to actually like get things done because that's how you get better, right? Okay. So Jimbo, what's your opinion on it? Because uh, Haley believes that, you know, you got to be accountable to somebody in, in, in the form of seniority at a work or maybe somebody uh, who's your client. And at the same time, you got to keep uh, taking classes to upskill yourself and that's how you grow. So uh, it's kind of a 50-50 from her. So uh, what, what is your opinion on that? Well, yeah, I mean, uh, it, 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 as they said, both of them, they, they, it kind of depends on the person. Um, some some people are, um, you know, so I, I I know some people that can just stay home and and, and do stuff the whole day, and I also know people I, I also know people that if they are not you know if they don't have feedback from someone as uh, Haley saying, then they won't um, do as much or they would just you know give up. For me, um, the best thing was um, you know um, went to a university that that really helped me out. Um, it really depends on the university you go to, but, um, even though, you know, when I started working, I kind of said like, oh, I, I kind of learned lettering by myself. I didn't need university, you know, but then maybe, you know, when I'm using something, you know, something more conceptual or, you know, whatever, some typography colors, uh, whatever it like going to university helped a lot. And now I realized that I actually needed that um so yeah i think it really depends on the on the people and i believe like if you have a bit of everything that's 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 good you know you just try to balance it out and and that's it and just as i said before just you know meet people for example um i had a i had two internships and and those helped me a lot um inside you know i i met my well when i met my creative directors they kind of became my like a like mentors for me so even now you know if i don't know something or you know sometimes i talk to them and i learn constantly so i believe like finding finding a mentor it's not like finding a mentor but just like you know meeting people and then just you know learn from everybody and from everywhere just try to be awake and yeah okay. that's it so uh Haley, let me just ask this to you you know since you're uh uh, very keen on, uh, you know, uh, preaching out there that somebody should take classes and then work simultaneously to be accountable to somebody. So what, what do you think is the minimum number of hours a day one should practice lettering and uh, typography for? So I guess it just depends on if you want to be good or if you want to be really good. You know what I okay. mean? <laughs> like okay. for me, I, I am lettering usually for depends on the day, but usually anywhere from four to six hours a day is usually about how much time every day I spend lettering. Um, okay. just because it is what I'm doing full time for my job. If you are just starting lettering and maybe you have a full time job doing something totally unrelated, but you want to learn, I would say try to set aside an hour a day. But I mean, mm -hmm. it's one of those things where it's like the more you practice, the better you're going to get. So if you want to get good faster, practice more every day. But if mm -hmm. it's something you're more just doing for a hobby, like an hour a day yeah. would be really good. But the more you can do, the better you'll get. But just make sure though that your practice is purposeful. I think a lot of times people think if they're practicing more that it's gonna be better. 
but you need to make sure that you're practicing like correct principles and really have focused practice, not just like random practice, if that makes sense. Okay. So Chris, what's your opinion on this? Is, is there a, a specific thumb rule in terms of the hours that you should follow to become better at art? Or it, you know, entirely depends on a person to, you know, how many hours he needs to get better at the job. Uh, I definitely don't think there's a specific amount of time. I think everyone's starting at a different place. Everyone has a different background. Um, I think you also, uh, uh, an important part of creative work is like that you're sort of enjoying it and it's like you're having fun. And I think if you're not having fun doing creative work, it's going to show in the work that's not going to be as good. So um, you don't want to be practicing to the point where you hate it because then you're not going to want to do it anymore. So I think it should be purposeful, purposeful, like Haley said, but also you should be having fun as well. Um, and I think if it's something that you really want to do, you're going to sort of be obsessed with it and want to keep doing it. So um, it also depends on how quickly you're trying to, you know, do what you want to do. Like if, if you don't have another job and you're like trying to start immediately, you know, you got to practice a lot more, or if you're doing it on the side, you know, there's, there's no right answer for, there's no general answer for everyone. Okay. So Jimbo people here are uh, pretty much interested in knowing that how many hours you practice uh, the lettering and typography in a day. So please reveal your secrets. <laughs> My secrets. Um, well, you know, it becomes easier when it becomes your job, basically. So, so I have to say, yeah, I mean, quite a lot. But even though I, I do other stuff as well, I don't, I just don't do lettering. So I, I also do design and, you know, graphic design, like playing graphic design. And sometimes I'm just, you know, struggling to fix something in the website. So sometimes it's not just lettering, but um, I believe um, just consistency. That's, that's, that's the only thing I would say to people, you know, just do it every day. Um, and again, uh, as Chris said, like, if you feel forced and you, you don't, you're not happy when you're creating, that's 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 maybe you should be creating something else so just try to make sure that it's something that you know you want to do not just for a living but as a as a way of living because you know like i, I remember when i was uh when i was uh, 18 you know i was i was like getting home a bit drunk sometimes and, and i would i would draw lettering you know so that was a big sign you know that that was telling me yo uh, you you can do that because you actually do it when you're tired you know so so yeah just just be consistent and just that's it okay all right so follow your passion be consistent and you know uh, uh, discover that niche that you are uh, mm. good at and what you're made for so uh, mm. let me just ask this question to uh, chris uh, this question has got seven upwards so uh, chris what steps to follow uh, to start lettering and typography as a free, as a freelance job ness is asking this question so I think um, it's a tricky one. So I think um, the with lettering, I think it's important to have an understanding of basic uh, typography. Um, I think what separates sort of um, good lettering from not so good lettering is that there's an understanding of typography, not necessarily that you're following all the rules because hand lettering is meant to be playful and, and loose, but um, there needs to be a, like an innate understanding of, of how type works and you're not, you're, there's some sort of basis in that. So I think um, if you don't have some sort of design background, making sure that you're, you know, picking up some books on typography and just studying that a little bit, understanding little nuances like, you know, why letters are thicker in one spot and thinner in another spot or, mm -hmm. um, you know, general spacing and things like that. So I think, um, yeah, just being, having fun playing it, but also studying some general rules. Okay. That... So what is, what is your opinion on, on this, uh, Jimbo? Well, yeah, I mean, you, you also, you always need a base. You always need something to, you know, to rely on so as, as he said like you know we all we all need some um you know some 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 background and, and like when you start doing a lettering um of course you cannot start out of scratch you like if you have a, a bit of theory then that's gonna help you you know build something that makes sense and and what i what i said in the workshop before is that uh rules are here to actually break them now that's what people say 
but you need to know the rules in order to break them. Uh, if you have no idea of the rules, then you won't be breaking anything, just just the artwork, you know? So yeah, that's that's my that's my take, yeah. And Haley, what would you have to say? So mine might be kind of on the other end of things, but if, if you're wanting to do lettering full-time as your job as a freelancer, you need to know lettering, but you also need to know business. And this is the part that a lot of people <laughs> think about. That's correct, I would agree with you, yeah. Yeah, if you want to be a here, like you need to understand how taxes work. You need to understand how to find clients. You need to un understand how to market yourself. You need to make sure that you have savings so that if you don't have work for a little bit, like right now, a lot of people aren't working, right? Because of this coronavirus thing, like you need to make sure you right. are financially secure enough that you can quit your job and go freelance. And so I think, yes, you need to learn lettering, but also if, if you want to do this as a freelancer, you need to understand all the other stuff that goes into it as well. And you need to make sure that, you know, things like copyright so that people don't steal your work. Those are the things you also need to make sure that you have an understanding of before you just like go all into this because it's a lot more, like Jimbo said, you spend part of your day lettering, but you spend the rest of the day emailing clients and invoicing and building your website and things like that. So it's really important to understand that those things need to be considered as well, not only the lettering. Definitely. That's right. That's right. And Jimbo, let me ask you this question. It's, it's again in the question section. Uh, people are asking it and it's getting upvoted a lot. Do you think that typography and lettering will overtake the use of photos uh, in the advertising and designing? And if so, why? I, I'm, I believe this is an ad guy who's asking this question. So please go ahead. I don't know. I think uh, there's always going to be a mix if that's kind of replying the question. Um, I worked in advertising a lot. I was in a, an advertising agency for a couple of years, and um, sometimes they needed my lettering. Sometimes they, 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 they didn't need my lettering. You know, so I believe like photography and lettering can always go, you know, by hand. So yeah, that's 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 it. Like it really depends. You know, it depends on the why you want to use lettering. If there is a purpose behind it. Uh, sometimes there is no um, in my work. Sometimes there there is no there is no point of using lettering, and I just don't use lettering. I use typography. Um, okay. Since sometimes I I do typographies of myself, I just use them, and I don't do lettering. So it really I think it really depends, and it's uh, it's it's yeah, it's it's a wide you know subject, and and yeah, that's my okay. point. So Chris, let me uh, take your opinion on this. I mean, do you think that typography and hand lettering is replacing kind of photograph uh, photographs and advertising copies that you see uh, across? Um, I don't think it's replacing it. Uh, I do a lot of work in advertising and um, in a lot of cases, the uh, lettering is um, being incorporated with, with photography as well. I think that's um, one of the nice things about lettering is that it, you know, you can, pair it with a photograph and it can add that like hand hand feel and like a, a warmth to the photograph. Um, but also um, I do a lot of uh, regular illustration that's not necessarily lettering as well. And that is sometimes um, will incorporate lettering too. So I think it's just sort of a mix of everything. I don't think one thing would replace everything else. And even if it did for like a certain season, like it got really popular, it, it, you know, it goes in cycles, things change. Yeah. Okay. So Haley, what would you have to say? Yeah, I don't think it's going to replace photography. I think it can enhance photography, but okay. it's not going to replace it. Yeah. Okay. So that, that's your answer, guys. Uh, so uh, let me take this last question and uh, let me ask it uh, to Haley first that, you know, uh, what should be the best strategy nowadays, you know, in, in order to maintain a, a balance between the creative freedom and staying commercially relevant? Because, you know, clients uh, and, and their requests, they're sometimes very, uh, you know, way off. And how do you balance this? Um, so I think balancing, geez, um, I think. <laughs> yeah, the, the, difficult, the most difficult question. <laughs> yeah, that's why I reserved it for the last. Ooh, one thing you can do as a freelancer. Well, okay, I've got two things. So first off, as a freelancer, you do have the liberty to pick your clients. And that is one of the best things about being a freelancer. And so I think it's important to be approached by a client who either just seems like they're going to be a real pain in the butt or it's a project that you're not excited about, say no, right? Like that is something that you have the liberty to do. And sometimes you're really strapped for cash and then you have to say yes. But as a freelancer, I think it's important to work with clients that you're going to be excited to work about so that it doesn't feel hard and that the demands are <coughs> tackling. And then the other side of that is I think it's always important to have 
personal projects that you're working on on the side that aren't for clients. And that will kind of keep your soul in a happy place and keep you excited about working. You know, even if you're working on a project at the moment that isn't really your favorite, it's not something you're super excited about. Having a personal project as well that makes you, you know, wake up in the morning and get you really excited to start working. I think that's really important to always be working on things that you are excited about. And then just share okay. those too. And that will lead to clients hiring you to do different things as well. Okay, that sounds great. So Chris, let me take uh, your opinion on this quickly. Yeah, so for me personally, I, I've been doing this daily drawing project for like 12 years now. And um, it's just become a part of my routine in my day. So I'm always like posting a new drawing and that has sort of um, led me to, it, it sort of directs my, my, the work that I get because I get hired for the work that I put out there. So it's allowed me to sort of um, kind of let my work evolve as I'm going. And um, it, it's like, I, I can experiment on new things and then slowly change things and try things. So that gives me the creative freedom to kind of do what I want to do, but it also informs my work so that the work I'm getting hired for also feels like that same creative freedom, even though it's specifically for a client. Okay. So, so Jimbo, what's your opinion on this? How do you manage this trade off between the creative freedom and, and taking requests from the clients? Well, the, the thing, you know, in a digital era, you don't have to, you don't have to show everything you do. And, and that's, I think that's the main thing everyone should understand. Um, if you, if you have an Instagram and it's just, uh, for lettering as I do, or they do, they do have it. Um, even if you are starting, listen, I started, um, my business, uh, uh three years and a half ago. And, you know, in the beginning, 80% of the work I was doing was, wasn't work that I was feeling great about, but but you know i decided to okay maybe i showed something that i shouldn't have you know just to get a bit more of that work that i didn't like but then you know on the other hand i was showing what i was doing every day and even even today sometimes you know like um i'm some some you know we had a we had a project a few months ago that it really paid well and i didn't i didn't like you know what i was doing so much so but you know i decided that i had to take it on because we were traveling and a lot of expenses were coming so i just took it i kind of you know i kind of you know save a couple of hours a day to do it but um i always try to to balance it with things that i really like so for example if i didn't have a lettering client and that's something i wanted to do as they just said right now i would just you know do personal stuff so every day i would go to sleep with a smile on my face even though i'm i'm, I'm getting work that i really don't like but at least you know i'm doing something creative on my own so yeah, okay. that's it. So, okay. So, all right, guys, this brings us, us to the end of this power pack panel discussion with our wonderful artists, uh, Jimbo, Harry, and Chris, where we touched upon a lot of topics and issues that the artists face on a daily basis. Although there's a lot more that we could, we could have discussed today, but unfortunately we are limited by time here. I hope you guys loved this session. Once again, I would like to thank you guys for taking out time to be a part of WTF 20. Thanks guys. Thank you guys. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thanks yeah. Again. See you Everybody, around. See you again. All right, guys, this is not where it ends. We have a lot more for the day. The next session that we have is a keynote speech by Dong K. Lee on the topic, how to find your creative flow in lettering tools, techniques, and process. So if you guys are interested and have not registered yet, I'm putting the link in the chat section to register now, and we will see you there. Cool. Also, you guys can join our WhatsApp group. Guys, you can also join our WhatsApp group. The link uh, has been uh, given below in the chat section. And uh, a lot of people are asking us where they can uh, watch this uh, conference live end to end and this uh, session specifically. So guys, I'm putting in uh, the Design Hill official YouTube channel link in this uh, section below. Uh, so you can watch it there. You can watch the entire conference and this section everywhere uh, there. So bye everyone, maintain physical distancing and take care of yourselves, take care of your families and your community all around. Thank you so much guys.
for being with us today. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.